Welcome to Coach to Scale, how modern leaders build coaching cultures. I'm your host, Matt Benelli. Join me as we build a community of like-minded professionals who share the belief that effective coaching improves the performance of every team member. Our mission is to help leaders become better coaches. The Coach to Scale podcast is sponsored by Coachem, the world's first AI coaching execution platform that leverages evidence-based coaching to increase quota attainment. And with that, let's get started. All right. Hello out there. I'm going to start off with a quote. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow once said, a single conversation across the table with a wise man is better than 10 years of studying books. And today, I have the privilege of sitting down with a friend and a wise man. He's someone who's uh, seen a lot uh, over the past couple of decades, whether it was at PTC, Oracle, Cision, or Everbridge, where he had leadership positions in each one, or in his current role of VP of Employee Experience at ServiceNow. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation with him. I know I am. Pat Galvin, welcome to Coach to Scale. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. We have gone back a long, long time together. How far back? What do you think? Turn of the century, maybe? Turn of the century. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, can we say that now? We can say turn of the century. Turn of the century. Yeah, that's what it was. 1999 into 2000. Remember, we were all huddled down thinking Y2K. We were all, uh, you know, we weren't sure what was going to end up. And instead, um, people need a lot of of technology. So so we, uh, we actually did well back then. Um, yeah. Even though we, we yeah, might the not world didn't end. The world didn't end with Y2K, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. So, Pat, listen, you've been doing this for a long time, and I'm excited to have this conversation. At Coach to Scale, we talk about coaching and developing and leading salespeople, sales leaders. So we're going to start off with a myth buster type question. So, Pat, what's a common myth about coaching salespeople or sales leaders you think is misguided or maybe misunderstood? Hmm. You know, I, I don't know. I, that's a great question. I'd say they're all true, right? I mean, we uh, we created this little fantasy land that we live in in sales, right? It's uh, it's hilarious when you think about it. The amount of myths that we employ just to to save our own sanity, right? Like, uh, think of some of the ones like um, it's on the CFO's desk. That one kills me, right? Like it's uh, Don Draper in the '50s, and that there's just paperwork sitting on someone's desk or uh, just a rubber stamp. Rubber stamp. I was just going to say yeah. that rubber stamp. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It's a rubber stamp, right? And I don't know. How, how do I get a rubber stamp, right? But um, that's when I know we're in fairy tale land when I hear the rubber stamp. Uh, and that always follows the same pattern. You ever notice that? Like rubber stamp goes right off the cliff straight into like the, the black abyss, right? Because about a week before the end of the quarter, you're like, so Ralph, how's that deal coming along? And they're like, oh, Pat, the, uh, he went dark on me. Oh, you mean the the thing that was sitting on the CFO's desk that was a rubber stamp, he went dark on you, right? Like, how does that, how does that always seem to happen? Um, but anyway, to be honest with you, I think, you know, we, we do, we do live in a little bit of those, those myths and, and we kind of need them. But if I had to answer your question directly, I'd say um, a big myth is probably that your top seller can be your next manager. Right. And I don't think that could be further from the truth. Right. In fact, it's usually the very opposite between what makes a really great seller and a really great manager are often, you know, two different skill sets completely. So that's what I would say. So, so the, the old adage that just because you were the superstar on the court or on the field doesn't mean you're going to be the best leader on the sidelines. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, you know, a, a top seller is really, you know, there's many ways to be a top seller there. Uh, they're motivated, obviously, by high achievement for themselves. They're just thinking about them themselves. How can they get their deals? How can they hit their individual quota? Um, usually they're on that lone wolf status, and that's very different from what you need a coach to be, right? A coach has a bunch of different attributes, and just because, you know, a coach can be a great seller, but not every great seller can be a coach. Okay, so just I, I just because I think we hear a lot. We hear this a lot in our business. And so what, what I hear you saying is just because you were a solid performer doesn't mean you earn the spot uh, as the leader of people. But I don't hear you saying that you can't be, go from being a top performer 
to being a great coach. It's just, absolutely not. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, have, you, you definitely can, but you know what, it's all about knowing what you're looking to get out of your own career as well. Right. Because a lot of, a lot of people just want to be a seller. There's a lot of things that go along with becoming a leader and becoming a manager that don't, doesn't appeal to a lot of people. You know, it's, it's kind of completely different career paths, I guess is what I'd say. A lot of people think it's linear, right? I become a rep, I kill it, I become a manager, then I become a VP and, you know, up, up the management chain. I don't see that as a hierarchy. Um, there are really successful people that just want to stay their whole career being sellers and they're, uh, you know, maybe even economically end up on the, on, on you know, beating everyone yeah. else on that. And so why does it happen consistently, Pat, in your view? Why do people continuously believe that just because someone was at the top, uh, was a top seller, that they should be promoted into management? Is it, I don't want to say laziness, but is it the path, is it the path of least resistance or is it something else? You had to pick one. Yeah, I've, I've, I've fallen into it myself. I think the main thing is that you, you think that they obviously have something figured out. They know the product, they know the pitch, they know the market, they can help other people just because of their knowledge, right? They're really good at what they do. So of course, they're going to be able to influence other people to act just like them. I think that's really the trap that, that people yeah. fall into. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a trap for sure. And so I know you're a big believer in building the right culture. And uh, we talk a lot on the program about building a coaching culture and everything that goes into that. From your point of view, Pat, what, what are some key things to consider when trying to build that type of culture? A coaching culture? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, first of all, I, I'd put it into three, three categories. I'd say trust, timing, and, and maybe tradition, right? So, so if we start with trust, you know, people need to know that they can be honest with you about their deficiencies. Uh, if they don't feel safe, which is another word of way to say trust, then they'll just fake hide and lie and then they'll never get better, right? They need to be able to trust that you're yeah. really there to help them get better. So I think that's a, that's an important piece. Yeah. Second one would be timing, right? And I think timing is really important to be able to coach in a particular situation, in a particular point of time. I think that's critical. You know, coaching can easily be perceived as criticism if it's done after the fact. Right. So when you're trying to coach someone after the deal blew up or after the deal is there, it's like, well, did you do this? Did you do that? Well, did you talk to this person? Did you, you know, did you try and ask them who the buyer was, what the buying process was, all of those things? So afterward, it could be criticism. But I think the timing of it, doing it consistently, saying, mm -hmm. hey, go try this. How did this work? And then coming back. And then last thing is the tradition, making sure that you are always doing coaching. It's not a one time thing, kind of back to that timing so that you're always coaching, that you're having conversations in the middle of the sales cycle, in the beginning of the sales cycle, um, and that good coaches create good coaches. Right. It's a pay, pay it forward thing. Awesome. Uh, trust, timing and tradition. And I really like what you said about the it's got to be consistent. Otherwise, it, it could come across as punitive or onerous. Oh, my manager you know, is coaching me. That means I did something wrong. Uh, I know, you know, we hear that all the time. Uh, so yeah, I get that feedback a lot too, right? And I think the higher up you go in an organization, when you're doing deal reviews and when you're not doing it on a regular basis, um, you're constantly trying to impart knowledge. But again, imparting knowledge backwards can see, can, comes across as criticism and people, uh, you know, might not take it the right way. Okay. So um, I, have a, I have another question for you, and it's a little bit timely because a blog, I, a blog post I wrote just came out today. So we'll see if uh, what your answer is and how it aligns with what I said in the, in the post. But little um, plug. Yeah. So performance or people? Performance or people from, you know, when you're looking at it from a leadership perspective, right? We all want performance. We, we, you know, okay. we all have a team made up of people. Which one comes first? Yeah, I'd say people 100 percent. Right. If you're looking to manage performance or or manage to results, which, by the way, is how many of us were taught to do for decades, you know, yes. that works for a while. Uh, but I've found goodwill to be an exhaustible resource. 
right? So that method rarely works in the long term. In fact, probably the only reason it does work is because you have so much attrition and turnover that you're keeping like a fresh supply on newbie goodwill at hand. Uh, but you'll never get the magic, right? You'll never get that true connection of managing for the career, not for the quarter. So I think it has to start with the people. Uh, and if you take care of, of, of managing and coaching the people, then the performance comes on top of that. And you, you mentioned the word that um, I know is linked, has been linked to you or phrased has been linked to you for a long time. And I don't know if you're going to, if we'd get to it later on, but you mentioned the word magic. And uh, I know a lot of people remember Pat is saying, hey, what do you think I have? The magic beans here? You know, you talked yeah. about goodwill being a finite resource you know what? What are the you know what is it about the the magic beans? What do seen the senior leadership be? What do others think that that leaders have that makes that finite resource an infinite resource? What are those magic beans, and what are magic beans? Right, you don't have magic beans. I, I no, I think I'd like to think I do sometimes, uh, but I yeah, can, I can. I'll, I'll sell you some, Matt. I yeah, got some. Magic I, I need beans, some. Yeah. I need some. I think. You know, the magic beans is actually I, I use it as as a, as a joke in that there are no magic beans, obviously. And so what 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 happens is look in sales, um, we're one of the few professions that has a really definitive performance metric. Right. It's really binary. It's either you hit your number or you didn't hit your number. Now, we know that there's a lot of things that go into whether someone hits their number, product, marketing, product market fit. Um, all of those other things. But oftentimes when companies are acting uh, in a data vacuum, which let's face it, a lot of companies you know, operate in a data vacuum, salespeople are very easily um, put on the put on the chopping block. Right. You know, like what we talk about, a C CRO is probably the most short lived C-suite executive that there is out there. And uh, and so the reason for that, I think, is, is exactly what we talked about is um, you know, people that don't understand sales, they look at the binary metric. Did you hit your number or did you not? Um, and they don't look at the other contributing pieces. And so I always uh, caution people that, you know, when you go into a new opportunity, you know, be really clear about that. There's no such thing as magic beans. So, you know, really dive in and say, hey, what is your marketing strategy? What is the product marketing fit? What is your net retention? What, you know, what customers are we going for? What's our attrition rate? You know, just don't fall into that trap that, you know, what we do is is really easy, but no one has that magic sauce that they can come in. And Matt's going to do a better job than this person because he has some ancient secret knowledge that no one else in sales has to, to make this company, you know, be able to sell ice and, uh, you know, in the Arctic. Uh, yeah, I I, I have fond memories of those types of conversations. So you said um, 100% people over performance, right? People comes first. You know, the, I, presumably, you know, you're thinking the people drive the performance, but it doesn't always manifest itself that way. And perhaps it's stress. You touched on the, the CRO's tenure. The stat that I saw most recently is that the average CRO's tenure, it's about 1.7 years whatever it is, not a lot. And, mm -hmm. and so um, this talk about coaching and developing and getting everybody uh, achieving that level of success, getting everybody over the hump of quota, uh, that's the long game. You know, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, since it is the long game and there's so much pressure, why is it worth going down that road? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, look, I, I mentioned what I like to, to say earlier is, you know, not coaching for the quarter, but coaching for the career, right? Um, and look, metrics and deal inspection are critical to a successful sales organization. There's absolutely no getting around it. Um, but when you focus only on the deals and you focus only on the quarter and you focus only on the metrics, I think it has negative effects on two fronts. Um, both internally and externally. So internally, if all you ever do is focus on the deals, metrics, inspection, you get basically a transactional relationship with your people. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what you're creating and that's what you'll get in return. So what does that look like? You'll hit your numbers, maybe, at least a couple of quarters, right? Uh, but it probably looks like a feast or famine. 
right? You'll have some people that blow it out. The majority are probably starving. You'll get regrettable att- uh, attrition, mm-hmm. and then you know, and you'll get it at the worst possible time when you don't want it, right? In the you know, in in November of Q4 when you don't want people to leave, and then eventually it leads to a toxic culture, and then externally, you're again, you'll hit some quarters. But you'll be pressuring your customers to buy. You'll be giving discounts rather than selling on value. You'll, you'll ultimately, you know, your reps will be churning and burning, and then they're going to be on to the next set of metrics in the next quarter, uh, and that will affect the customers. And their critical projects will be left behind, and then you don't have references, and then you don't have upselling and all of those things that that go to that. Now, like I said, deal inspection in metrics are critical, but you have to have uh, a sense of empathy and authenticity to it. Right. Your Mm. team has to know the why you are measuring metrics so intensely. So, for example, I'd say, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm I I use a lot of metrics. Right. Um, But I I try and tell my team why we're doing this. Right. We're, We're measuring ourselves so that we can showcase to the rest of the company all the hard work that we're doing, mm-hmm. right? This is brand protection. I'm not doing it so that I can make sure that you're working on a Monday or a Friday afternoon. I'm using this data to make our department bulletproof so that when people start pointing fingers, which they always do, they can't point them at us because we're showcasing all the hard work that we're doing, that we're making the calls, that we are understanding the value proposition, that we're checking down and doing our sales metrics and that we understand our methodology and that we're having deal maturity and deal maturation. You know, those are things that run a sales organization, but you need to be able to, to prove that to the rest of the company. Hmm. Um, yeah. M- metrics drive successful businesses, but the right ones and for the right reasons uh, are the ones that people get behind and, and help drive a sustainable business over time. So coaching for the career, not the quarter, the quarter. Did I have that right? Yeah, Absolutely. Love that. Love that. I want to tie back to something that you s- touched on earlier when you brought up the, the, the binary nature of the performance metric, meaning you hit your number or you did it. You hit your forecast or you, or you didn't. And so mm-hmm. think about the team performance. And this is a this or that question. And um, you know the answer is both, but I, I want you to weigh in one way or the other. And so the question is, is it better for a team to achieve, let's say, 120% of quota, but that 120% is um, on the backs of two people who made their number? Only, let's just say, 20% of the team made their number. They blew it out, and they carried the whole team to 120%. Or, Pat, is it better to have slightly lower performance, let's say 110%, but every person on the team just got over quota. What would you say to that? Yeah, geez, I feel like these are softballs, right? So, I mean, for me, I would say that it is much better to have 100% of the reps making their individual quotas um, with everyone at 105-ish, uh, rather than a few people, 20% making, you know, the majority of the quota. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if 100% of people are making their quota, you might want to look at the quotas, obviously. But I think the momentum and, you know, if, if, if people, A, you want your sales reps being successful, you want them making money. And what that also means is that you're you're done your territory planning the right way, that there are equitable territories across the board, um, that everyone understands the pitch and that they're selling it appropriately, whether it's across verticals, whether it's across geographies, et cetera. Um, and then that's where you're really going to foster a positive culture, right? Because winning begets winning. Uh, and I think, you know, rather than that feast and famine example that I talked about earlier, when multiple people are being successful, they're more collaborative, they're helping share information back and forth. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think by far that would be the, the better solution than, uh, than having just a few people at 120%. I think that probably indicates that there is some serious problems in the org. Okay. And uh, look, I, I, you always call it like it is, and perhaps it was a softball question. It's a softball question. I think we can agree in the classroom, so to speak, um, yeah. you know, uh, over, over a, a beer. It's a softball question like when you're, you're taking a test, what's the right answer? But the reality is it's, it's not that way in real life. I mean, 
Do you think, totally. do you think that every rep thinks their manager cares about everybody making their number? Or do you think there's a healthy percentage of reps who, for one reason or another, think that manager only cares about themselves? And as long as the team gets over the number, they don't give a crap about everybody on there. What do you think? Right. Yeah, and that's a that's an astute point. And by the way, when I say it's a softball question, I was I was being tongue in cheek because the reality is, uh, I think it's rare to have a hundred percent of the people making quota. I think, unfortunately, more often than not, it's more lopsided than that. Um, and so, I think, um, yeah, I think that 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 reps probably do feel like, um, you know, well. That's a good point. I think it, do, do reps, I don't think reps, if you're doing it the right way and you're leading with authenticity and you're being, um, you know, you're, you're being a strong leader and all the things that we talked about managing for the career, not the quarter, then hopefully the reps would understand that they want everyone uh, to to be successful. Right. And I think that's an important piece that every manager has to to have that trust make sure that they know that they're getting the right coaching uh, and that there's consistency across the board, right? At the end of the day, I think that's what sales reps want to see from their leadership. They want to see consistency. They want to know that they care about their success. Uh, and I think if those things are there, any any good leader that sees that there's that much of an imbalance will be constantly trying to uh, find ways to, to fix it. Yeah. Well, it re- reminds me of the saying, people don't care what you know or how much you know until they know that you care about exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So, right. um, Pat, let's um, let's talk about you a little bit. Um, let's talk about My Pat favorite topic. Galvin. Favorite topic. Yeah. Listen, everybody, <laughs> and everybody knows that. Um, so, so Pat, you've been doing this a while. Um, lots of lots of lessons. Uh, some of them we laugh about. Uh, but what's one very important lesson you've learned along the journey? when it comes to coaching and leading people? Uh, I would say um, be authentic. Be, be, be your authentic self. So, so that's a cliche. Okay. So let's, I, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent by the way, but I think some people out there listening, you're like, okay, <laughs> authentic, authentic self. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, you know, yoga phrase. Um, and my wife is a yoga teacher for a long time. I know a lot of the yoga phrases, but, but seriously, a lot of people know you and me together and they're like, what's Pat talking about authentic self? So can you but talk about that a little bit? Now I'm throwing the softball. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is really just about me and you're right. You know, when I say it, maybe it can come across as new agey or, you know, uh, something simple, but I know that I'm being my worst when I'm not being my authentic self. And let me just say about authenticity, it doesn't mean you need to be a yoga instructor or Gandhi or a guru. It just means being who you are consistently. You know, you can be an authentic jerk. Uh, you can be an authentic uh, coach, etc. cetera. Uh, so it's not, there's no morality uh, implied with this that I've learned. What I'm saying is that when I'm trying to be a version of a manager that I think the board wants, or that someone that hired me to be the heavy, if I'm trying to be that hardliner, you know, from our early days of, 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 you know, PTC and Oracle, and, you know, when I'm trying to be that version of a manager, um, I'm not as effective as a leader. That's what I've learned. And I've fallen into that trap many more times than I'd like to admit. And, and to be honest, maybe some of it is my authentic self, because I do think you need to put the lead down at times. Uh, right. I think you do have to to come across and, and get your message across, especially when we're talking about metrics and those type of things. Uh, but when I truly thrive personally as a leader, it's when I get past that stage and be my authentic self and show people that I care about them. You know, I have that Boston kind of maybe a little bit of that Boston sarcasm that comes out. But that's when I lead with passion, when I lead with that love for my people. Um, I think that helps. I think that helps the medicine go down. Uh, to be quite honest. And so that's what I mean by leading with authenticity, because I think people can sniff out bullshit from a mile away. Um, and so that's what I'm constantly trying to make sure that um, 
that I'm just being being who I am, not trying to be something different. And uh, and it's hard. It's hard to stay that way because you have to be vulnerable, right? Um, you have to get over things like imposter syndrome. You have to be vulnerable. You have to uh, admit that you don't know things. And that's constantly a struggle. At least it, it is for me all the time. Yeah. And it is a struggle. I know it's a struggle for a lot of leaders that have been doing this for a while, and especially people who are just coming into the business. Authenticity is actually one of the key values of, of, of our company, uh, of Coachum. And mm-hmm. you know, so we place a lot of value in that. Why is it so difficult? Or Pat, maybe is there an example that you can think of that, or a type of situation where leaders aren't at, aren't their authentic self? Yeah, I think so. I think there's lots of them. I think um, I, I think oftentimes if people, I think leaders, and, and again, I put myself in this category. I think you uh, leaders feel like they they need to know the answers all the time. That they have to have the answer. That they have to have that solution. Um, like we talked about, you know, coming on board with that that whole NFL coach theme. You know that you have to have this magic bean playbook, and if you don't, everyone's going to see through that. And how come you don't have magic beans? Like you're supposed to. That's why you have this big job. Uh, and so I think that's that's an area that uh, leaders might fall into that trap. And so if they are if they're acting like that, then they're not being authentic, which means they're not being vulnerable. And if they're not being vulnerable, then they're not learning, uh, and then they're not getting close to their people, and they're not you know showing that. Uh, that making that connection. And then they go to, what do they go to? They go to metrics, deals, deal, 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 quarter, 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 performance, performance, performance. Uh, and they, they'll squeeze people, but then they get into that trap where then you're getting, you know, regrettable attrition and a toxic culture and you're not making those connections that translate into managing for a career than managing for a quarter. So I think it's all tied together. Coach for the career not just the quarter. I, I keep coming back to that. I love that phrase. So okay. Pat, you're at service now. Now. You're now at service now. Right. Um, for the audience, what does service now do? And what do you love about what you're doing over there? Yeah. You know, um, at service now, we have a tagline. Uh, we make work work for everyone. Right. So what does that mean? Uh, In every company organization, there are people and technologies that are striving to solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Right. At ServiceNow, we make the work that they have to do better, faster and more intuitive. Right. And so we do that by providing a platform that creates simple workflows that automate services that these companies offer to their employees and their customers. So that's what we do at ServiceNow Um, in the end. And by the way, um, right before we got on um, this platform together, uh, my daughter, Chloe, is out visiting um, us out here in Park City for the first time. And she said, Dad, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm interviewing Pat Galvin um, on the podcast. And he, you know, he's a, a bigwig over at ServiceNow. And she's, oh, I know what ServiceNow is. And she didn't say we may, they make work work for everybody. But what she did do is say, hey, at, at her company, Accenture, this is how she uses services now, service now. And uh, yeah, it was yeah. positive, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I like that she knows it. We're we're in with that Gen, Gen Z crowd. That's, that's good to know, right? Um, I think, look, at the end of the day, um, it's service now, it's in the name, right? So we help with service requests. So you don't have to do that, Matt. So Chloe doesn't have to do that. You know, service now, like you ring a bell. I want service now. As opposed to service later, which exactly. is what which is which what is, you get when you call up you know, 1-800-I-need-help-with-whatever exactly. it is. That's all right. You know, people don't want to submit a ticket. They don't want to sit on a phone listening to Muzak. They don't want to send an email and have to track it. They want to be able to click a button and get whatever service they want given to them, whether it's internal or external. Your business is very important to us. The The average hold time is four hours. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. But anyway, what do you love about what you're doing over there? You know, it's it's actually what you just mentioned about Chloe. I love the fact of our customers 
love our product, right? And that's so important. When we talk about all the things we've talked about product market fit, it makes a huge difference. And it makes a difference in helping people get through their days and make their days easier. So it's really exciting to talk to customers because they absolutely love it. And when you have a great customer experience, then we have great people working for us as well. And so the culture is excellent here. We have really smart people um, who enjoy what they do, enjoy making a difference. Um, you know, they have the hearts of heroes and, and some of the you know, verticals that we serve. Uh, the, you know, that's one of the great things about working here is uh, the culture and the people. Wow. Um, thanks for sharing that. So. Pat, we've spent a, a lot of time talking about different aspects of the business as from a leadership perspective and coaching and developing people. Most people who care about others, who care about coaching, um, were the recipient of really good coaching somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. What about you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I used to joke and say that I come from a uh, noble lineage. Right. And well, you did um, come from Winchester, right? There's a lot of nobility in Winchester. Master. Exactly. Thanks for doxing me, too, in the middle of this. But uh, yeah, exactly. I come from I come from noble lineage. And uh, but I say that I come from a noble lineage of management. I've been really lucky to have some incredible managers throughout my career. And it, and it can make or break you. Right. Because I also believe we are an amalgamation of all the managers that we've had, good and bad, by the way, over the years. And so if you're lucky enough to have some really great managers, you're going to have all of that as part of your manage, manager, management mosaic or your leadership kind of piece that you're becoming. And you have some of the bad stuff too. Uh, but I've been really fortunate to have a lot of great managers and leaders over the year that I've been able to lead from. Um, you know, I remember one particular time when I was, uh, I was really relatively young into, into management. Um, and I was trying to figure out how to be a manager, right? And I was one of those top reps that became a top manager that got promoted into management. And I was trying to figure it out. And the COO of one of these uh, big companies that I worked for, he used to bring me up to the third floor uh, and let me sit in on some really heavy meetings, uh, meetings that he'd just say, hey, just sit in the corner and listen, don't say a word. Um, and I probably learned more in those phone calls than I would have learned 10 years in experience, right? Just the way that he uh, interacted with other C-suites, um, the way that he handled situations. And he would do this with me one or two times a week. He kind of took me under his wing and he was showing me how to be an executive when I was really just a brand new frontline manager. And I've never forgot that. Uh, and the lessons that I learned there, like I said, would have taken me 10 or 10 or 15 years to learn, uh, you know, outside of that room. So did you ask him to do that? Were you in a management development program? I guess part of what I'm, I'm asking here is for the people that are listening that are like, wow, I don't get that. Uh, I'm kind of new. I'm trying to figure it out. Like, is that something I can ask a senior person for? Um, I mean, how did it happen for you? And what do you, what advice do you give to other people who might want that experience, but it's not falling in their lap. Yeah, um, I, I sir, I, it wasn't a management program. Again, I was, I was, you know, first thing probably grace to have a really good leader there. Um, but I was very enthusiastic about it, right? I, I, I interacted with as many people as I could. Um, I wasn't afraid uh, to, to speak to my executives. I was prepared when I spoke to my executives about the things that I was looking for and, you know, asking them questions. And, and, and so that, that's one of the things that I have to mention there is that, you know, I always made sure that I was in the right place at the right time, whether that was, you know, early before work or after work to be in, in, in a place where I would interact with those executives. Uh, and then when I got the chance, I was prepared. But there was a lot of it of, of him just uh, taking me under his wing for whatever reason that is um, in, in wanting to, uh, like we said, coaching is a tradition that he must maybe someone did it for him and he was willing to do it for me. And, um, and he brought me in there and it, you know, and I owe him, uh, I owe him a lot for my career because of that. What's his name? I mean, do you, are you open to sharing it or? If, if yeah. Yeah, absolutely. His name's Grant Wilson. Grant Wilson. Yep. All right. COO. Shout Pizza. out to Grant Wilson. All right. Yeah. yeah. Listen, look, you do this for a lot, a long time. It, uh, you don't get enough, you don't get enough kudos in this business. So when someone says something good about you, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah. let's, let's name names. 
I should probably say he, he didn't let me listen to any proprietary information. So uh, I'll just put that disclaimer. Out. If he did, statute of limitations <laughs> is uh, gone by. It's, 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 that was a long time ago <laughs> exactly. when you were at PTC. So um, kind of going down memory lane a little bit there, Pat, I know we, we share a lot of laughs. Uh, yeah, we yeah. have done so over the years. You know, I think people like newer leaders, you know, just getting started, perhaps, you know, experienced people, but just from another industry, they, they come into this technology, this software world, and, and they're, you know, they might not believe some of the stuff that used to happen. It was almost uh, like uh, it was in a different world. What's one of those hard to believe stories from the vault, Pat, that seemed like it happened in a different world? Oh, this is a G-rated show, though, right? I could share, you know. <laughs> there were so many, right? It's so it's it's absolutely wild, Matt, to think about the difference from you know the the world that we were raised in, uh, from managing and selling to now. I mean, it's it's almost unfathomable. Um, and there are so many areas, right? So many uh, forecast calls where you're being called every name in the book. Uh, any it, the nicest one would get you uh, fired on the spot in today's world, right? Of the things that people would say to you, um, but so so some one some of the cleaner ones that I think would stick out. I remember I went to an interview, uh, and again I was you know uh, young young in my career. I had my suit on. I was ready to to run through walls, and I had prepped for this interview. And I walk in, and uh, the gentleman had a big chew, and he kept spitting chew into this cup, and uh, asked me a few softball questions. Uh, and then in the middle, he said, oh, stop, stop, stop. You think you could take me? And I, I, was, I had no idea what to say. I couldn't even fathom what he was. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? And he said, do you think you could take me? If I came over this desk right now at you, do you think you could take me in a fight? Um, so it, it was things like that, that it was completely took me off guard. But those are that that's a great story that people love. And I'll, I'll never forget. Did he did you ever find out why he asked you that question? I'm, as, I'm assuming it, 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 it was for a reason, at least in his own mind. Yeah, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. I got the job. Um, I'm trying to even remember how I, 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 I like sort of blacked out because I didn't even understand what he was talking about. I'm assuming though, back in the day, it was like to test how, how, how resilient you were, how you react under pressure. From, yeah. Left field, you know, and that you could uh, think on your feet or something like that. But it was just so, so outrageous that uh, it's always stood out. Could you have taken him? All right. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll been right along. So Pat, um, we've covered a lot of ground in today's conversation. Yeah. Before we sign off, uh, any advice for the folks out there that are just looking for that nugget that, you know, just something to help them get ahead, something to help them get through the pressures of the day with uh, all the economic headwinds and, and the noise that there is out there in the world? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll go back to just um, don't, don't be afraid to be to be your authentic self. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable as a leader. I think if you lead with passion um, and you lead with with love, you're going to get those results. And it's OK. You can do both. And I think that's you know the best thing about it is anyone can do that. Right. Anyone can be authentic. You just have to be your authentic self. And as long as you're coming from a place, it doesn't mean you have to be a pushover. It doesn't mean that you have to be nice, that everyone you know, needs to love you. It means that you're just being consistently yourself. And if you truly care about your people, you're going to have you know, amazing results. And I think people need to, uh, to feel I think sometimes people have to be told that that's OK. You don't have to be some other type of leader. You can only be the leader that you are. And so you might as well run with that. Awesome. So Pat, uh, learned a lot. I was looking forward to this conversation and certainly wasn't disappointed. We talked about in authenticity. We talked about trust, timing, tradition, and we talked about coaching to the career, not just the quarter. Uh, let, we'll, we'll leave it right there. Really, really appreciate having you on today. Thanks so much, Pat. Matt, it was a blast. Thank you. And uh, congratulations. This is a, this is an awesome podcast. Uh, I've loved the ones that I've watched so far, and I'm looking forward to the ones that are going to come.
Thanks for saying that. And thanks to all of you out there for listening. If you learned something today, if you laughed a little bit, uh, tell someone about the podcast. If there's someone that you would like to hear from, shoot us a message. We'd love to hear what you have to say. And so it's been my pleasure to host this conversation on behalf of Coach the Scale. And until next time, coach them if you want to keep them. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Coach to Scale, How Modern Leaders Build Coaching Cultures. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at coachem.io. That's C-O-A-C-H-E-M dot I-O. And follow us on Twitter at Coachem Now. See you all next week. Thanks for joining. And remember, coach them if you want to keep them.